Now let's talk a little bit about the different types of requirements. We've already said that our requirements should be SMART. Now we're going to discuss what type of requirements that we have. And one of the first elements that we'll look at is we'll look at core security requirements. So what we need to address is we need to address how we're going to satisfy the CIA. Confidentiality, integrity, and availability. That's our starting point, and we'll address other areas of security as well, but we start with the CIA. So when we talk about confidentiality, we may think about encryption. We want to protect and keep secrets secret. So we will document how we're going to protect, for instance, personally identifiable information. We'll list out specific algorithms or at least minimum key links, minimum degrees of security. Um, we'll address overt attacks on confidentiality like uh, uh, cryptography and masking requirements to prevent um, data loss, if you will. Not data loss, but data compromise. So when we talk about cryptography, of course, we're talking about encryption. When we talk about masking, um, when I enter in a password, for instance, and you see the asterisks instead of my password, that's masking. And that'll keep customer service reps, for, for instance, from seeing vital information. Like if they pull up your account, they'll see nothing but asterisks and then the last four of your social security number, for instance. So that helps with um, overt attacks on cryptography. Covert attacks on cryptography might be steganography. And steganography, now, now again, this doesn't apply in all instances, but this is just an example. With covert attacks, steganography is a message inside another message or um, uh, essentially embedding a message in another or in some other format. So we might want to document how we're going to address steganography and guarantee that that's not an issue. We also want to think about when we're addressing confidentiality, we also want to think about the three states in which data can be. It can be at rest, in process, and in transit. So when we talk about confidentiality, we're going to say, okay, data at rest at rest should always be encrypted using no less than AES 256-bit encryption. Okay? When data is in process, there's not a whole lot you can do to protect data in process because once data, even though data is encrypted on the hard drive, it must be decrypted to get loaded into RAM while a representative is working on that information. Then it gets re-encrypted for storage. So you can't really do a lot to protect, uh, to encrypt data in process, but you can follow good security requirements like a clean desk policy, making sure that someone can't read your screen, you avoid um, shoulder surfing, you know, some of the basic security requirements. Don't leave your desk without locking your system. Data in transit. We might say all data in transit must use a secure transition protocol like maybe SSL or TLS or IPsec, but must be protected in transit as well. So some various uh, examples of confidentiality requirements. Again, how are we going to address the needs for privacy with our software? Now, other secure uh, requirements for uh, uh, the CIA triad, the next is we look at integrity. So how are we going to protect against modification of the system, modification of the data, making sure that the system performs as it should? You know, for instance, when we talk about system integrity, making sure internal and external uh, values are consistent making sure that we um, protect against it, code injection. And code injection is a huge problem uh, anytime that we allow user input. We'll talk about code injection more later. Um, data integrity, making sure that the data, the file hasn't been modified, log files, whatever, in transit. And for those uh, types of modifications, we look to CRCs, checksums, uh, we look to hashes or message digests, Macs, for email messages, we think about digital signatures. Um, so again, this is how we address integrity. And we might document certain uh, integrity requirements like input validation should be used on all forms, software should require anything that we publish should also provide a message digest so that when the user downloads, they can be guaranteed that they the application they've downloaded or the file they've downloaded hasn't been modified. All of those are ways that we would address a system and data's integrity. 
Now, for availability requirements, again, CIA, don't forget availability is the A in the CIA triad. So how can we guarantee uh, that this product is available to meet the customer's needs? Well, service level agreements, where we commit to a 99.999% uptime. Uh, and if our product doesn't meet the customer's needs or doesn't meet that uptime, we generally compensate them in some means. Um, we can provide for our customers um, uh, mean time between failure and mean time to repair metrics so they can assess whether or not this mechanism will meet those needs. Uh, recovery point objectives, meaning what is the customer's tolerance for data loss? How current must the data be? What's the longest maximum tolerable downtime? What's the longest the customer can be without this system? So you can see uh, down below some examples of availability requirements. Software must meet the availability requirements per the SLA. Also, what about support? How many users should be able to access the software simultaneously? Um, how is replication going to happen? Those would be issues that we'd address with our availability requirements. Then we move on to think about authenticity. And we talk about authenticity, we want to validate an entity's claim of identification. So I'll identify to you by saying I'm Kelly Handerhan. The authentication place piece says I must prove it. So do I, um, you know, in some applications, like usually web-based applications, we allow anonymous access. Anybody can access the web page because I want anybody to go to the website and purchase things from me. We can use basic uh, authenticity where there's a password. Now with basic, the password's transmitted in clear text. That's a problem. With digest, it's a challenge response system, so the password doesn't appear on the network in plain text. We can use certificates, we can use tokens, there are all sorts of means, smart cards, biometrics, there are all sorts of ways that we can authenticate, but ultimately that should be specified as part of the requirements for our program. We might also uh, address multi-factor authentication, mutual authentication. So when we talk about multi-factor authentication, uh, you must provide a password and a smart card or you must provide a thumbprint and a password, something like that. Uh, more than one factor of authentication. Mutual authentication means the client authenticates to the server, but then the server also has to authenticate to the client. From authenticity, we also look at authorization, so making sure that the subject is authorized to access the object, but that the subject only has the rights based on lease privilege. And we've talked about the principle of lease privilege. You're giving the absolute minimum rights and permissions to do your job. So we want to make sure that principle of lease privilege is always followed with authorization. Uh, that needs to be addressed. I love the CRUD operations, love the CRUD acronym, create, read, uh, update, and delete. But again, making sure that based on job requirements and role within the organization, you have just the bare minimum permissions. And we talk about some access control models, DAC, MAC, and RBAC. RBAC standing for role-based access control. One of the models I did not mention is RUBAC, which is rules-based access control. Rules-based access control would be used, for instance, like on firewalls or any sort of filter. Rules-based systems follow if-then logic. If traffic is coming from the 10 network, then allow it. If traffic is coming from this network, then deny it. So that idea based on rules would be another way that we control access and we require authorization uh, before we authorize uh, an entity, a subject to access an object. Okay, so some authorize, authorization requirements might be access to highly sensitive information is limited to users with secret or top secret clearance. Unauthenticated users will have read permission to public access page. You know, whatever those requirements are that meet your needs, we have to address, address authorization. Accountability. When we talk about accountability, we want to be able to trace an action to a subject. Accountability and auditing go hand in hand. And the success of auditing is really based on the identity of the subject. 
an action is going to be mapped to the identity. So if you go back, you know, 10, 15 years ago, in many offices, there would be one user account that everybody in the office would use. And this was in smaller offices, but you might have an office of 10 people and everybody had a single account. And I won't even address the fact that that single account usually had administrative privileges. We won't even go down that trail. But the problem with users, multiple users sharing the same account is we get no accountability. User one is an account shared by 15 people. So who was it that actually went in and modified the registry? We don't have that knowledge because we don't have separate identities. So identities are a really important part to allow authenticate, I'm sorry, to allow accountability and auditing. So accountability requirements, all failed login attempts must be logged. There must be source ID, there must be timestamp. Um, lab, uh, we could go back and add integrity requirements that say audit logs must be hashed to guarantee no modification. So you can, you know, you can um, uh, reference multiple requirements at the same point in time. You know, that accountability is only accountability if we can guarantee the integrity of the audit files. Uh, how long must we retain those audit logs? How about overwriting events? What happens if the log files get uh, full? Again, these are all requirements that we would address. All right, uh, authorization. So of course, authorization is what you're authorized to do, what activities you can perform, and we've already talked about that a little bit. Those are the core security requirements. From there, we're going to talk about general requirements.